G'day! Welcome to Nevadia. Well, well, well. The other week, a very exciting thing happened. The 30th first annual Ig Nobel Prize Ceremony occurred on the 17th of September. Every year they have a new theme and this one was Bucks. This was the first time it was hosted solely online due to COVID restrictions. I was lucky enough to catch it live, so I thought I'd give it a more detailed breakdown of the research that awarded these people their coveted prize. But when I say more detailed, I mean that I just read the abstract and maybe some of the conclusions of the studies. That, to tell you the truth, is definitely something you should never do when reporting on a scientific study, but in this case, as I'm not actually breaking it down, I'm just giving you a bit of an overview, I thought I could get away with it. All links, of course, are in the description below if you want to do better than me and obviously research it for yourself. This year's prize was a PDF in which the winners downloaded and made it into a box with various types of bugs on it. And my personal favourite, they also included the instructions on how to make said box. I thought that was a funny little detail. The winners also received a piece of paper saying they won the Ig Nobel Prize as well as a real count of it. 10 trillion Zimbabwean dollar note. I looked up how much it was worth and you can buy one of these for about $4 on eBay. I put timestamps in the description below if you want to watch the awards yourself. I kind of suggest you do, it is definitely an entertaining hour. The first prize was the acoustic surprise awarded to Stefan Reber, Takeshi Nishimura, Judith Janish, Mark Robertson, and Tecumseh Fitch for inducing a female Chinese alligator to bellow in an airtight chamber filled with helium-enriched air. Okay, I know that's kind of random, but for more context, the abstract of the paper says this. Crocodilians are among the most vocal non-avian reptiles. Adults of both sexes produce loud vocalizations known as bellows year-round, with the highest rate during the mating season. Although the specific function of these vocalizations remain unclear, they may advertise the caller's body size, because relative size differences strongly affect courtship and territorial behavior in crocodilians. In mammals and birds, a common mechanism for producing honest acoustic signals of body size is via formant frequencies, vocal track resonances. To our knowledge, formants have to date never been documented in any non-avian reptile, and formants do not seem to play a role in the vocalization of anurians. We tested for formants in crocodilian vocalizations by using playbacks to induce a female Chinese alligator, Alligator sinensis, to bellow in an airtight chamber. During vocalizations, the animal inhaled either normal air or a helium-oxygen mixture, heliox, in which the velocity of sound is increased. Although heliox allows normal respiration, it alters the format distribution of the sound spectrum, and acoustic analysis of the calls showed that the source signal components remain constant under both conditions, but an upward shift of high-energy frequency bands was observed in the heliox. We conclude that these frequency bands represent formats. We suggest that crocodilian vocalizations could thus provide an acoustic indication of body size via formats. Because birds and crocodilians share a common ancestor with all dinosaurs, a better understanding of their vocal production systems may also provide insight to the communication of extinct archosaurians. Makes sense. If you want some background on why your voice sounds funny when you inhale helium, I've left a link in the description below. For context, helium doesn't make your voice go higher, it just makes the higher frequencies produced by your voice louder, which makes it seem like your voice is higher. So basically, these scientists wanted to find out if crocodilians had a similar vocal structure to mammals and non-avian dinosaurs, and that's how they were able to test it. The second Ig Nobel Prize was awarded to Miranda Jackman and Nicholas Rule for devising a method to identify narcissists by examining their eyebrows. The abstract of the paper opens with this. Though initially charming and inviting, narcissists often engage in negative interpersonal behaviours. Identifying and avoiding narcissists therefore carries adaptive value. Whereas past research has found that people can judge others' grandiose narcissism from their appearance, including their vases, cue supporting these judgments require further elucidation. Here we investigated which facial features underlie a perception of grandiose narcissism and how they convey that information. Basically, what this paper did was try to figure out if narcissistic personality traits can be picked by other people simply by looking at neutral faces with no other cues such as mannerisms, dress, or emotion. They came to the conclusion that, yes, people can pick a narcissist using purely facial cues. 
People could also identify narcissists from inverted pictures. This suggested that independent features were the cue, not just the whole face. Eventually, they were able to narrow it down to find the eyebrows and the eyes were the strongest indicators of identifying a narcissist. And I quote, Although we did not find direct positive evidence implicating the eyebrows as the definitive cue to narcissism, the combination of A, significant accuracy for the total eye region, but not when occluding it, B, significant accuracy when occluding the eyes, but not the brows, and C, no accuracy when occluding the eyebrows from the full face suggests that the eyebrows play a critical role in perception of narcissism. The third Ig Nobel Prize went to... The governments of India and Pakistan for having their diplomats surreptitiously ring each other's doorbells in the middle of the night and then run away before anyone had a chance to answer the door. That, of course, is pretty self explanatory, yeah. And I have to admit, I giggled. The fourth Ig Nobel Prize was awarded to Ivan Maximov and Andrei Potatsky for determining experimentally what happens to the shape of a living earthworm when one vibrates the earthworm at high frequency. And the abstract reads as thus. Biological cells and many living organisms are mostly made of liquids and therefore, by analogy with liquid drops, they should exhibit a range of fundamental non-linear phenomena such as the onset of standing surface waves. Here, we test four common species of earthworm to demonstrate that vertical vibration of living worms lying horizontally on a flat solid surface results in the onset of subharmonic Faraday-like body waves, which is possible because earthworms have a hydrostatic skeleton with a flexible skin and a liquid-filled body cavity. Our findings are supported by theoretical analysis based on a model of parametrically excited vibration in a liquid-filled elastic cylinders used Using material parameters of the worm's body reported in the literature. The ability to excite non-linear subharmonic body waves in a living organism should be used to probe, and potentially to control, important biophysical processes such as the propagation of nerve impulses, thereby opening up avenues for addressing biological questions of fundamental impact. I'm not a physicist and I'm not even going to try to explain what this means. Instead, I got a real physicist to demystify it for me and this is what they said. Thanks, Navadia. I mean, the short summary is that they put a couple of sedated worms on a subwoofer. Yeah. See, they even have a nice little diagram of it. You know, that totally wasn't made in word art or anything, and it's not as though I've never done that for a publication. But what were they looking for? What was the point of this? As the abstract suggests, they're looking for Faraday waves inside the worms. Faraday wave is a non-linear standing wave, which might sound complicated, but for now, you don't need to worry about the non-linear. For a standing wave, it's just where the nodes are fixed, so it doesn't appear to move. In one dimension, it looks like this. For Faraday waves in more dimensions, though, the easiest way to understand them, I think, is just to look at a few. Here's a quick mock-up. Let's take a look. For Faraday waves, you need a vibrating container and a fluid. Here, I've cut a plastic cup and strapped it to an old speaker. Then I filled it with some water with a few drops of red dye. As you can see here, we get different patterns for different frequencies. And we can get very close to a standing wave. It looks like everything is almost staying stationary. Furthermore, we can get to a point where the system becomes unstable and looks like it's boiling, sometimes referred to as the fountain phenomenon. For this Ig Nobel Prize, the worms were the container and their soft insides were the fluid. Lovely. To observe the waves, they used a laser, a camera, and a measuring device known as an oscilloscope. They studied four species of earthworms, plus a mimic. Here are some of the results they got for the different frequencies they observed. The authors claim that this was an important step to understanding certain aspects of biology. Look, I like playing with lasers. I mean, I do it for a living. But sedating earthworms? Navadia, back to you. Thank you to Almost a Doctor for that. Please go check out his channel for some more sciencey goodness. The next prize was awarded to... Christopher Watkins, Juan David Leon Gomez, Jean Beauvais, Agnieszka Zelanowicz, Max Korbmacher, Marco Antonio Correa Varea, Ana Maria Fernandez, 
Danielle Wagstaff and Samuela Bolgan for trying to quantify the relationship between different countries' national income inequality and the average amount of mouth-to-mouth kissing. The abstract for this paper is as such. Romantic mouth-to-mouth kissing is culturally widespread, although not a human universal, and may play a functional role in assessing partner health and maintaining long-term pair bonds. Use and appreciation of kissing may therefore vary according to whether the environment places a premium on good health and partner investment. Here we test for cultural variation, 13 countries from 6 continents, in these behaviours slash attitudes according to national health, historical pathogen prevalence, and both absolute, GDP, and relative wealth, GINI. Our data reveals that kissing is valued more in established relationships than it is valued during courtship. Also, consistent with the pair bonding hypothesis of the function of romantic kissing, relative poverty, income inequality, predicts frequency of kissing across romantic relationships. When aggregated, the predicted relationship between income equality and kissing frequency was over five times the size of the null correlations between income inequality and frequency of hugging, cuddling, and sex. As social complexity requires monitoring resource competition among large groups and predicts kissing prevalence in remote societies, this gesture may be important in the maintenance of long-term pair bonds in specific environments. Basically, they had two hypotheses. One was, if kissing plays a role in assessments of quality, the benefits of assessing partner quality are likely to be greater in less healthy environments. And the second one is that theoretical perspectives argue that monogamy and slash or relationship investment are valued in harsh environments, such as those where resources are scarce in relative or absolute terms, and the pair bonding hypothesis proposes that kissing plays an important role in how couples maintain and monitor the quality of a committed romantic relationship. And yes, they found that more mouth-to-mouth kissing there was in a country, the more likely that country was to have wealth inequality. I thought that was interesting. The next prize was... The management prize this year is awarded to Shi Guang An, Mo Tian Shang, Yang Kang Sheng, Yang Guang Sheng, and Ling Xian Si, five professional hitmen in Guangxi, China, who managed a contract for a hit job, a murder, performed for money in the following way. After accepting payment to perform the murder, Shi Guang An then instead subcontracted the task to Ma Tian Xiang, who then instead subcontracted the task to Yang Kang Sheng, who then instead subcontracted the task to Yang Guang Sheng, who then instead subcontracted the task to Ling Xian Si, with each subsequently enlisted hitman receiving a smaller percentage of the fee and nobody actually performing a murder. Again, this one is pretty self-explanatory as well as absolutely hilarious. What made it better was the last person to accept the hit asked the person to fake their own death, which is how these hitmen were eventually caught. The entomology prize was awarded to Richard Vetter for collecting evidence that many entomologists scientists who study insects, are afraid of spiders, which are not insects. This one's another fairly self-explanatory one too. Richard Vett advised a questionnaire which the person responding had to meet three criteria. One, consider themselves to be entomologists. Two, at some point in their duties, handle whole-bodied arthropods that are alive. And three, have negative feelings towards spiders. Arachno-adverse entomologists appear to share many traits with arachnophobes in the general public. Two observations have emerged from this study. One, arachno-adverse reactions, which often started at a young age, were generally not overcome through habituation even after decades of exposure to insects. And two, although arachnophobia and negative reaction to disgust evoking animals were correlated in the general public, arachno-adverse reactions among entomologists still were extant even though the latter group works with non-charismatic insects. Despite the assumption that entomologists would extend warm feelings towards spiders because of their habituation to arthropods in general, arachnophobia does occur in some members of our profession. For these people, two more legs makes a big difference. The Medicine Prize was awarded to Ninke Wulink, Damien Denise and Arnaud van Loon for diagnosing a long, unrecognized medical condition, mesophonia, the distress at hearing other people make chewing sounds. When I saw this, I actually thought this was really good research. The introduction to this paper reads as such. 
In 2009, three patients were referred to our expertise centre in obsessive compulsive disorders at the Academic Medical Centre in Amsterdam with obsessions focused on a typical sound such as smacking or breathing and the subsequent aggressive impulse to scream and yell or attack the source of the sound in order to make it stop. This cluster of symptoms does not fit any of the well-known obsessive compulsive or impulse control disorders but has been anecdotally referred to as misophonia, meaning hatred of a sound. The symptoms, personality traits and coping mechanisms of the patients show a striking similarity in nature and development. The consistent pattern of symptoms suggested the presence of a discrete and independent disorder. However, within the current classification systems, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, Text Revision DSM-4-TR, and the International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems, 10th Revision, ICD-10, there is no option to officially classify the disorder. In this paper, we describe the clinical symptomatology of misophonia, discuss the classification of symptoms, propose diagnostic criteria for misophonia, and introduce a concept assessment scale, the AMISOS. In their acceptance speech, they mentioned that people with this disorder can have their lives severely impacted by it, including losing jobs and relationships as well as isolation. While it might seem funny and trivial to us, it clearly isn't for some people. I refer you to my ARFID video for another socially crippling disorder that has been trivialized. The next one was simultaneously hilarious as well as morbid. The winners are from Brazil, the UK, India, Mexico, Belarus, the USA, Turkey, Russia, and Turkmenistan. The Medical Education Prize is awarded to Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil, Boris Johnson of the United Kingdom, Narendra Modi of India, Andres Manuel Lopez Oprador of Mexico, Alexander Lukashenko of Belarus, Donald Trump of the USA, Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey, Vladimir Putin of Russia, and Gurbangali Bur Mohamedou of Turkmenistan for using the COVID-19 viral pandemic to teach the world that politicians can have a more immediate effect on life and death than scientists and doctors can. Yeah. <sighs> the winners of this prize are the leaders of the countries that were hit hardest by the recent outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. And last but not least, the final Ig Nobel Prize winner goes to, drumroll please. The Material Science Prize is awarded to Metin, Aaron, Michelle Beber, James Norris, Alyssa Perone, Ashley Rutkowski, Michael Wilson, and Mary Ann Raganti for showing that knives manufactured from frozen human feces do not work well. I think Ryan Reynolds speaks for us all. But why? Well, the reason why is clearly explained in the abstract. The ethnographic account of the Inuit man manufacturing a knife from his own frozen feces to butcher and disarticulate a dog has permeated both the academic literature and popular culture. To evaluate the validity of this claim, we tested the basis of that account via experimental archaeology. Our experiments assessed the functionality of knives made from human feces in controlled conditions that provided optimal conditions for success. However, they were not functional. While much research has shown foragers to be technologically resourceful, innovative, and savvy, we suggest that this ethnographic account should no longer be used to support that narrative. So a big congratulations to the winners of the Ig Nobel Prize for 2020. Which one of these was your favourite? Is there one that you want to, me to dive deeper into in a future video? I hope you have a wonderful day, evening, night, whatever, and don't forget scandium, iodine, nitrogen, and cerium. I just want to say a very special thank you to my wonderful patrons, especially my $10 Redback Spider patrons, Aiden Furball, Lauren Hart, Amanda Vogue, and Ross Deveroux. I also want to say a very special thank you to my $20 Platypus patrons, Ethan Stroop and Paul Butler. Personally, my favourite was a toss-up between the Management Prize, which was the Hitman one, and the Peace Prize, which was the Indian and Pakistani diplomats knocking on the doors and running away. Hope you had fun with that one, and I'll talk to you soon.